Hello, everybody. Oh, <laughs> good. Um, thank you so much for coming along. Um, hopefully, we'll make this uh, entertaining and fun uh, and enlightening and all that sort of stuff. Um, my name's Alistair Blackwell. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Decoded. And uh, normally talk about teaching people code and how important it is to upskill our children with the ability to code for the web. But today, talking about design. Uh, how many designers in the room? How many people are running um, are developers? Web developers? Uh, how many people are interested in startups and running businesses and that kind of stuff? What, what do you guys want out of this talk? Is it, is it to see the process of how a business went from nothing to decoder kind of thing? OK, cool. So a bit of background on uh, decoded. Uh, we run workshops for business people, teaching them how to code. It's digital enlightenment. The thinking is, come in for a day, build an app, and leave with a clear understanding of how the digital world is put together. You understand front-end technologies. You understand how you use an API to harness data. You understand how there are uh, JavaScript APIs now where you can kind of do geolocation and get access to the the phone uh, camera and the contacts and the, all that kind of stuff, like the whole HTML5 thing, which I'll come to in more detail later. But we, we run these workshops for businesses. We've had been very lucky and had an enormous amount of press and publicity. My business partner, Catherine Parsons. Who's heard of Catherine Parsons? Katie has, good. <laughs> she's, she's amazing. She's always in the press, and she's very, she's very cool. Um, she's always out there being like, hello, we're decoded. Uh, write an article on us. So we've been very lucky with our thing. We are um, an organic business. We haven't taken on any uh, capital. We all work for about a year doing other jobs while we set it up. Um, and we are about to launch now a, the Decoded Foundation to bring free training to teachers who, I mean, who, is anyone following the whole computer science in schools thing? Yeah? Yeah, my sons are here, both of them are 21 and 23. And they said to me, Mom, I don't want to do GCS computing because I'm not thick kids do computing. Oh, no, only thick kids do computing. Wow, OK. So you've changed their minds from that mentality, hopefully. No, they still need to do the computer. OK, <laughs> okay fine. <laughs> mechanical engineers. Mechanical engineers, amazing. So there's been a big movement over the last two years to get computer science onto the UK curriculum and to teach our children essential digital skills, actually making stuff. And we've been very vocal in this and have identified the key problem is that it's teachers who need transforming with the knowledge and the confidence to actually facilitate the learning process in the classroom rather than it being in after school clubs and stuff like that, which are obviously fantastic, but nothing against after school code clubs. Uh, so have people heard of Code Club? They're amazing, they're amazing. Uh, but we, yeah, we, we, we're training teachers and we're doing it for free. And the question is, how can we do all this? And hopefully over this, literally just half an hour, we'll keep it quite short, uh, or 25 minutes or so, we'll see how the, the, the way that the web has actually developed and kind of is designed. Uh, and then uh, my background and my business partner's backgrounds from the sort of a design angle has led it to actually be possible to run it, to have a company where you can teach people to code in a day and also where teachers can come for a day and actually kind of gain the confidence and the knowledge to actually go out there and, and teach our children enough so they can go off and have the opportunity to become developers in the future. Does that sound good? Yeah? Great. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm accepting tweets on that one. If you want to tweet, we'll make this interactive. Uh, okay. So, Chief Technology Officer. This basically means that I'm in charge of all the technical stuff at Decoded, but it's a very human business. It's essentially face-to-face -face workshops. It's a training company at its core. Uh, but there's a lot of technology behind the scenes. Uh, there's our booking system. So we take payments from individuals. Uh, we have to uh, just like, automate loads of stuff, like the feedback forms and all that kind of stuff. We have a website. It's responsive. I'll show you the website. Um, this is our website. Uh, and it does that. It's optimized for mobile and stuff. And it's these technologies and, and the way that you can do stuff like this that, that, that's meant that the, oh, I'm not on the internet. Oh, it's fine. We don't need the internet. That means that we can do this stuff today. But can everyone still hear me? OK, good. Uh, hopefully, um, by, by looking at the web and the history of the web, people will leave uh, this uh, with a clear picture of, of how it all pieces together and also like the design of the web and what that means for all of us and other businesses. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to start in 2004. 
And uh, I took a play to the Edinburgh Fringe in 2004. Has anyone been to the Fringe Festival? Were you in a play? What were you doing on it? Okay, nice. Did you watch All's Well That Ends As You Like It? No? It was a Shakespeare parody. Uh, it was ridiculous. We were on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, all in kind of Shakespearean garb. Like My character was licking a parrot. It was a kind of a crap Richard III. Uh, it was great fun, though. But we needed a website. And uh, I got given a book, Teach Yourself HTML the Right Way from Scratch, and the, the FTP details to a server, because a friend of mine had set up the, the sort of the basics. And we built a website for this thing. Who remembers building websites for the web in 2004? Who remembers websites in 2004? They're horrible. They're really ugly. It was, uh, it's all tables. So you're, now you're meant to use tables to structure data. But people were using tables to structure layout, because there was no way uh, of, of doing it properly using CSS, cascading style sheets, which is a language of design and style on the web. Uh, how, I mean, how tech savvy are people? How many people here are, are hackers, are developers? Couple. OK. Uh, how many people have? Uh, okay, cool. We'll just we'll just just carry on, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, that was Shakespeare with his tongue sticking out, and we built a website. It was a brutal world back then. Internet Explorer six had 95% market share. Microsoft didn't release an update until 2007, which meant that 95% of human beings were viewing the web through an abomination of a web browser. Uh, this was something that was stuck in the year 2000. And if you think about how fast technology moves, in six years, it's been probably less than six years since the first iPhone. It's probably been six, like less than six years since flat screen TVs were invented, yeah? We've got Google Glass in like just a year. Like, it's a mad, like Moore's law, you know, eight, every 18 months technology doubles in speed. To have a browser from the year 2000 in the, in the year 2007 was crippling. So Microsoft did actually hold back the development of humanity for seven years. Uh, they've got better now. Internet Explorer 10 is great, uh, but they have a lot to answer for. So if you ever meet anyone from Microsoft, give them a hard time. No, they, they're fine now. Um, but it meant that building, coding stuff back in the day was really hard work. It wasn't fun. I mean, it was. It was great. It's like Sudoku, but at the end, you've got a web page uh, or something like that. It's, it is very, very satisfying and fun. But it was hard work to get things to look uh, right cross-browser. So that was 2004. The web was a, a bleak place uh, full of horrors. In 2005, I got to Nottingham University, and we ran a uh, free party called Crave. It was a rave and a cave. Merge the words together. Uh, Crave. And, uh, and it was great fun. We had lots of uh, interesting things. This is the old Facebook uh, page. There's people partying. There's a little green man. Uh, and it was it, it, this. I don't know what uh, David Ashton was doing there. Uh, but it was like this mad party. And it needed a website, too. So I um, built another site then. It, and, and was in pursuit of the holy grail. Who remembers the holy grail of web layouts? And this is a precursor to the responsive design that we all enjoy today. Does anyone remember seeing this? Yeah? It's got a fixed middle column. No, 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 hang on. It's got, a, it's got fixed outer columns and a, and a, and a fluid inner column. Whatever, whatever screen size you view it on, this thing will, will work. This was amazing. Because the web's always been like percentages. But having a thing where you could actually uh, Resize it, and these things stay the same width. Was was mind blowing to to web designers back in the mid noughties uh, It really was. Uh, so I was at university doing a degree in English, four or five hours a week of contact time, and spent most of my time trying to achieve the holy grail of web layouts. For uh, luckily for everybody, the website's no longer online, so I can't show you. It was achieved. There was a very uh, rude message in one of the columns to users of Internet Explorer 6 and the IT department at Nottingham University for not updating it. Who here is still using Internet Explorer 7 or 8 at home or at work? No? OK, good. If you ever find an IT department, perhaps your children's school who are using Internet Explorer 7 or 8, um, talk to the head, and they should be hauled up for negligence. Is that a bit strong? <laughs> it's probably a bit strong, isn't it? Because um, it really is a crime. So that was in 2005, but the web was, there were people trying to make it better. It was kind of, it was getting better, but it was still brutal. The big change happened in the year 2006 with the rise of uh, these things called libraries. Uh, that chap there is John Rasig. Who here's heard of John Rasig? Yeah? He is the founder and the creator of jQuery. And jQuery is a JavaScript library that makes 
um, writing, building websites and web apps much, much easier. It abstracts huge amounts of the ugly stuff that you have to write to deal with Internet Explorer 6 and 7 and, and, and gives you a platform on which to build really uh, nice things. Um, so the web was, was slowly improving. I was still there at uni. That was me and Macbeth. You ready? <clears throat> I wasn't planning on doing this. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in this. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> no. OK, fine. I'll get to the good stuff. Uh, so I was in Macbeth, and, and we, uh, we ran the theater at Nottingham, and this was the, uh, the website for it. Now, this is a new one, and check this out. These are fonts. So before, you, couldn't have, you didn't have fonts on a website. You had images, static images. Uh, and there was something, that the, the capability of, uh, of design, the things that you could do with design on the web, were improving all the way through. Because we're now in a really good place, which is why I hope Everyone can leave here being like, great, you know, we can all do really cool things now because all that history's been done. But this, um, that's text. When I first built this website, it was, uh, that was a, a graphic. So they've, they've, and it, it looked exactly the same as that, but it was made in Photoshop and set as a background image on a, on a text element, and on an HTML element. But now you can embed web fonts on a server uh, and, and, and have them in your, in your site. So that all the while, the web was getting, was getting better. Um, and then in, uh, in 2010, I graduated in 2008 and uh, set up as a freelance web designer in 2009. Um, but a sort of side project that my friends uh, and I were working on was this TV comedy series called Behind Bars. And uh, it was a three-part, 10-minute web episodes thing. We won 10 grand off Deutsche Bank to make it. And uh, is this too personal? I was tr I'm trying to go for, here's the thread of the web, the history and the technology. Here's my thread, and then when we get to decode it, it's only possible because of that, oh, those threads. Is that making sense? Is it working for people? Yeah? OK, good. So I haven't practiced this at all. Um, OK, so uh, behind bars. And this was uh, this thing here. And every time you play this, do you see how up here in the uh, URL, you've got FB action IDs. You've got those parameters. And that's because this page is an object on Mark Zuckerberg's social graph. So when you view this page, if you're signed into Facebook, if you're authenticated, or if you click a link from Facebook, it adds uh, something like this to your timeline. So do you see how it's, this is my Facebook page? And it says, Ali watched episode one on Behind Bars. And that's frictionless sharing. How do people feel about frictionless sharing? Scary, yeah? Do you remember when The Independent did it? The indie newspaper? And you'd go on it, and suddenly your newsfeed is full of the articles that you've been reading. And you've been reading about st you know, stuff that you'd prefer people didn't know you were reading about. It just caught your eye. And suddenly, it's all over your Facebook. Um, but if you hover on here, it shows you. And it's all, all in, the, in the source code. It's got the sort of the meta tags in it that say um, what, the, what the bits are. And uh, not him. <laughs> uh, but then you click more details, and it takes you to that page. It's not on the web now. It's, uh, it's not, the computer's not on the internet. Um, but that thing tells it to post it to there. So that all the time behind the web, it was uh, the, the capabilities were getting were getting better. It was, it was it was becoming a social web, and I was reading articles at the time about the rise of the social web, and this being the next big breakthrough. Once you've bought a um, a product on an e-commerce site, you have on your checkout page, you have like share it with all your followers, and suddenly you can make things go uh, viral much more easily. Um, this was uh, influential on this. This is one I built for uh, a florist called Tom Flowers. Um, and it all shrinks and, and things. Uh, but when, once you've checked out, it invites you to share that you've done it. And that means that you can kind of go viral. So all the while, the web was developing these capabilities to build really interesting businesses, uh, which you know, affects all of us, like these, these, these capacities, these capabilities. Um, so that was uh, those years. In 2000 and, uh, 10, I thought it was going to be 2011, uh, in 2010, some more stuff happened. That We had the birth of uh, responsive design. Is everyone familiar, familiar with responsive design? So I did it. You, you design for mobile first. And Luke Reblo Reblowski, who was uh, doing cool things at, uh, I think, at Skype. He was lead user interface designer. He's an amazing thinker. Published a very influential article called Mobile First. Uh, this is in 2009. 
And it's like mobile's exploding. By 2015, over 50% of stuff is going to be on a mobile uh, device. You know, it's already getting there, and it's only 2013. Uh, it forces you to focus rather than having, you know, if you're uh, going to really paraphrase badly someone, but he's like, if you're um, a customer looking to book for a restaurant on your mobile, you want the, uh, the menu and the, and the contact details. When you're on desktop, you really want the ginormous dot ping file of the pasta as well. You know, you really want all that extra crap. But you don't. Mobile forces you to focus. And that's a really good thing in uh, kind of user experience design is like, what does your user actually want? So this, this focus on mobile first was really cool. In 2010, it was implemented properly for the first time by um, John Hicks, who designed actually uh, the Firefox logo, the original uh, Fox. Um, and Hicks design, I, when I first saw this, my mind literally blew. Does anyone, does anyone, has anyone seen this site before? People seen the Boston Globe website, where it sort of shrinks down? It's, it's everywhere now. Even um, Gatwick Airport, they've just done a redesign. <laughs> I saw it this morning. It's actually really, it's all right. I don't know if I've still got it open. I haven't. But this, I was just like, wow. Wow. <laughs> They're just amazing. It's the same site. Now, this is old hat now. But this uh, web capability, uh, the fact that you could design a site for multiple screens with one HTML file and just different CSS code for each uh, screen type was amazing and was a big step forward. And it's the whole reason that at the, you know, this campus party, we've got all the Firefox OS people you know, talking about this web browser operating system that's going to solve mobile access and smartphone access for the majority world, which is amazing. Um, so I was doing things like uh, William Gaze Limited. Uh, this is a, uh, still live, this one. It's got the web fonts in it now. Uh, it totally shrinks, shrinks down. And uh, you've got design, finally. You've got like, typography and stuff on the, on the web, which is really, which is really nice, because before, it was all really, uh, really rubbish. So 2011, we started Decoded. Uh, and we needed a website. So of course, by now, we were going to build a responsive site that was uh, designed for mobile first. But also, we wanted to design a workshop where you could teach someone to code in a day. Show of hands, people who think th thinks that's a completely preposterous idea. Yeah. And I think we've probably really offended all the developers who are here as well. I've spent. 10 years learning this, and you're saying you can do it in a day? Why, <laughs> you know? Uh, and we got a lot of uh, controversial kind of feedback when we first started up. Everyone was like, Get, go away. <laughs> you can't do this. Guardian articles were written about it, and you know, the, the, the flamers and the threads were just terrifying. Um, but because of what's happened on the web in the last 10 years, since about 2004, because of HTML5. And HTML5 is, uh, you've still got that language for, for structuring content in HTML. You've still got CSS, a very simple uh, language for styling uh, HTML. And then JavaScript, the third language of the web, the, the language of behavior and interactivity. These three things, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, content and design and behavior coming together all kind of cutting edge now, all working in browsers that are versionless. Who can tell me what version of Chrome we're on at the moment? Or Firefox, you know? I'm sure there are lots of people here who know what version of Firefox we're on, because everyone's, a lot of Mozilla people, people who build Firefox are here, which is quite cool. Um, but it's kind of, everything's gone versionless. HTML itself has gone versionless. There's going to be no HTML6. It's now a living standard, um, which is always going to be at the, at the cutting edge. So it's a super exciting time for the web, um, and a super exciting time to be, you know, setting up a, a business because uh, the barriers to entry are, are much, much lower. Because you can just publish a site that works on any device, uh, you can you can start anything and, and do anything. Even that that builder's website that I showed you before, William Gaze. Uh, where's it gone? I was really excited about this because part of this brief was actually to build an app that worked on his iPad, that worked on his client's smartphones, where they could log jobs and, they, and his subcontractors could do stuff. And that was only possible then, in about 2011, I think this one was, uh, because of you know, the rise of smartphones and tablets and responsive stuff. And I see every single industry had the capacity, the capacity to be radically changed 
by web technologies. We, you know, we all hear all the things about how, uh, how disruptive technology is, but it really is, and I think no more so than the, the, you know, the web being the, ma the major factor in that, uh, of opening up access to technology and, and changing the way people can do business. Um, and that was also true for, uh, for, for, for Decoded, because we could actually take someone uh, in a workshop and say, okay, today, from scratch, you're going to write some HTML and build a homepage. You're then going to style it in CSS and have a, a media query in it so that it scales and is optimized for mobile. Uh, we're then going to use some simple JavaScript to, to use the geolocation so you know where they are. We're then going to use a, a formula called the Haversign formula, which you just Google search. No one knows how to calculate the distance between two points, right, to work out how far away from something someone is and therefore whether they've arrived there or not. No one knows how to do that. You just Google it. And this is the big thing. Uh, you know, the rise of Google, the rise of easy access to web technologies, uh, it was possible, and it wasn't possible three years ago. So Decoded only became possible because of the, uh, the kind of the maturing and the development of these technologies into the sort of ripe web platform that we've got today, which is so exciting. Did anyone see any of that stuff about the open agenda yesterday? Uh, so Telefonica, yeah, big sponsors. Thanks, Telefonica. Uh, they are a company of 250,000 people, apparently, which is bonkers. Uh, and they're kind of, you know, there's uh, iOS, there's Android, and then there's potentially Windows and Nokia as the third smartphone platform, yeah? Um, Telefonica are like, what are we going to do? So they're embracing this stuff too, you know? And they've teamed up with Mozilla. I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted. And, uh, and are, are getting well behind Firefox OS, which is this amazing web-based operating system. Have you all seen Chrome OS? Chromebooks, yeah? It's a web browser that's also an operating system. So all of your software runs in the browser. You use uh, Google Drive for your thing. You use Maps uh, in the browser. Everything runs in the browser. Image editing, everything. Um, so there's a, yeah, like, it's only in the last three years this has been possible, which is why I thought good to show the history of how in 2004, when I was building that scrappy website for our ridiculous Shakespeare farce at the fringe, there'd be no way that Telefonica could do what they're doing or Decoded could do what we've been doing over the last couple of years. So uh, this journey that um, uh, I went on and Decoder went on and my business partners went on because they came at it from not understanding technology necessarily. I'd had a kind of a hands-on uh, experience of building websites, of building digital stuff, and they hadn't. But that was a wonderful thing because the way, we, the way I see our business is that we stand at the um, technology changes all the time. You know, we saw that Moore's law. But actually, people don't necessarily change. And for technology to have a real impact on society, people need to change too. I think that's what Decoder does. If it had been up to me, we wouldn't have had that humanity, I don't think. It was the, uh, the combination of uh, my business partners, Catherine and this guy, Richard, who uh, were just like, no, no, stop speaking jargon. What does that actually mean? What, what's an, a what? an AP what? An API what? You know, like, like people who don't get it coming together and actually distilling all this stuff, which is my, why this talk might be a little bit baffling. Is it baffling or how are people feeling? All right, we'll, do, we'll get on to questions in a moment. Uh, so yeah, we're looking to the future. All that stuff with Facebook and the social graph, like the future, I saw the chat from MIT speaking yesterday and he's like, this is the decade of data. And it is, you know, our, our next thing is called data in a, in a day and it's about understanding this weird thing of data. Cyber security, you know, like how secure is your, uh, is your data? It's not, the NSA are reading it all. GCHQ are reading it all, it's terrifying, you know? But for businesses, this has major implications. For like the water companies who run, like Thames Water, if they get hacked, then we know we'll all be eating sewage and drinking sewage. Horrible thought. Uh, but it's super, super important, this. And uh, so that's what we're coming on to next. So things I've learned. Uh, it, it's coding is only ever a tool. So all this stuff you hear about, learn to code. It's really important that you should learn to code. It's, what, it's rubbish, you know? It's not about learning to code, it's about just learning to make stuff. And the beautiful thing about the web today is that because of um, that kind of design process that it's, that it's been through, uh, the way HTML and CSS and JavaScript are in their own distinct um, concerns, they're separated into those three concerns of content and design and behavior, uh, it's really nice and easy now to learn. Uh, and for a business, which is what we learn as a coder, it's really nice and easy to harness those technologies to do stuff that you could never have done before. 
So we've got a, um, a back-end system. Uh, this is our booking status with uh, all the sensitive details blurred out using a CSS feature. Oh, God, OK. <laughs> we won't do that. Uh, OK. Um, but this is, I mean, there's, there's loads of stuff going on. There are people making bookings on the website, people giving feedback. We've got a whole CRM. This is pulling down all of that information uh, and displaying it so that our team can see who's coming and, uh, and what's going on, all that kind of stuff. And just like this is built in uh, a thing called Angular.js, which is a new JavaScript library from Google. And I actually um, I met a, uh, a guy, he's probably 18 or 19, um, who's just learning to start coding now. And this is a fantastic way in, the technology behind this. Uh, so the, the capability of, I mean, it's such an obvious thing to say, the capability of businesses day to day are defined by what the technology can do. But the technology now is amazing, you know? And God knows what it's going to be like in 10 or 15 years. But you can do some really cool stuff now. So coding is only ever a tool to get something, something done. Uh, there's lots to learn and there's lots to teach. Uh, I found a lot of my time as a web designer was briefing clients about how to do it. And that's, that's uh, where I think some of, the, uh, some of what made decoded work came from, is that like, uh, how many web designers are here who, who spend a lot of time briefing clients? teaching people. How many of you guys in your day-to-day -day life spend a lot of time passing on your expertise to people? Fair all amount, yeah? Talking to people about stuff? Uh, it, ha it happens, and there's a, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff to, to, to teach. Um, and then the web is amazing, uh, because it does give itself to this idea of HTML and CSS, and then you learn programming visually, and it's perfectly structured. And it's this um, sort of the structure of web technologies, the design of them almost, even though it's been a uh, a chaotic process full of competing opinions and browser makers and all these kind of people. Uh, it's now in these three categories of HTML and CSS and programming and JavaScript, which you can now teach this. And it's this uh, idea that, you can, that we can now run workshops with teachers where you can give them the skills and the confidence to teach our children in schools to code. And you can do that in literally one, one day. And then signpost out to all the resources that are out there on the web, so the Khan Academies, the code academies, uh, all the all the online MOOCs and things like that. Um, so as that was the end. But hopefully, uh, I've shown you that over the course of the last ten years, there's been um, the way, because of the way the web's developed, it's enabled us to do what we've done, which is teach code in a day uh, in London, in New York, all over the world, uh, and grow into a kind of a, a, proper, a proper business, because we're now a proper business, I think. Uh, but also to take that to teachers. And hopefully, I mean, our ambition is to solve the crisis in education at the moment, which is that teachers have no idea. And yet, they have to be able to teach our children computer science and, and coding and stuff across the curriculum, not just in the ICT lab or in the computing suite, across the curriculum. But because, because the way technology is structured today, because of the way the web is structured, we can do this. It's why we could do decoded, and it's why I'm confident we can solve this, uh, this problem that, 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 that we're facing now as a, as a world. Good, OK. So uh, that was the talk bit. Are there any questions? How did you find it? Was that what you were expecting? Go on. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm learning a little bit now uh, responsive design. And I have a question. Let's see if you can give me a, a good answer to it. OK. I really like that what you have been doing. And I learned a little bit how to do it. But the question is, why everything has to be, uh, why the distances, why the measurements has to be done with the, with the relative distance? For example, you have an iPad, you have an iPad mini. Mm. You use it with the same hand. Why the buttons have to be smaller on one and on the other? Because when you make it smaller, the things have to, to shrink a little bit. Why not use the actual distance, centimeters or inches, instead of relative distances? It's a very good, it's a very good question. And when you were building fixed layouts in the past, it would always be 980 pixels wide. And if you're feeling really brave, you'd go up to like, 1120 or uh, 1024 or whatever it is, uh, pixels wide. But the reason today that you can't necessarily use fixed units and you have to use relative units, um, and there's a unit called the M. People heard of the M? The M is as old as Gutenberg's printing press, and it is the width of a letter M in a given font. 
and in uh, user interface design on the web and in, uh, in everything else, you use the M to, to, as your unit of measurement. So you say that your logo is going to be, I'll come to the answer in a second here, yeah? it's context, uh, 25 M's wide. And therefore, it'll be 25 times as big as the, as the character M. And that means that to scale that and to scale everything on that page, the only unit you have to change because you, you, know, you may be viewing it on an iPad mini and want it a bit smaller, and then an iPad and want to bump it up a bit, all of it. So you, you, if you use M's, then you can just adjust the body's font size on your page to 110%, and everything scales. So um, that's one reason. The other reason is that uh, with the Retina displays that are in now, a pixel is no longer a pixel. The actual Retina display on a MacBook Pro has 2,800 pixels or something. But because of the way they do, they divide it. It's actually, it thinks that it's 1,024 pixels. So that's why if you've got one of those high-res screens, it, everything isn't really small. Uh, so there's actually no such thing as a fixed width anymore. Everything has to be relative, and everything has to scale. And if you're designing for the web today, you're designing for Google Glass, even though that might not have been invented when you started building. But you're designing for uh, technologies that haven't even been invented yet. So you need, to, you need to make it as fluid and responsive as possible, which is why we use responsive units. Does that answer the question? Not really. OK, shit. Yeah, it answers. I just have another question. Okay. Why not tell the web which device is running on so it knows how many centimeters or inches has so then he can adapt to this? Mm -hmm. that, that used to be the way you did it. So you'd have in your CSS code, you'd say, uh, if Internet Explorer 6 do this. If Internet Explorer 7, do that. Uh, if you know Netscape, do something else. It's just totally impractical. If you think now about the gazillions of, not gazillions, that's a hyperbolic overstatement, but if you think about the millions of different devices, or rather different Android handsets, all with different browsers installed, it's impossible to browser sniff. You have to just design uh, once to, to, uh, to work on as many different things. And that does mean using relative units, I think. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody else? Yeah? Hi. When you uh, started up, did you have a vision of being an IT company or a training company or, or something else? And how did you get your first clients once you did start up? Good questions. So when we, when we set up, we had the vision of being a digital company. Um, but we knew that we were going to have a very human heart. Uh, we also knew that we were going to have a business model if we, if we did the, went down the training route, because it's a very simple, uh, ancient business model. You turn up, you pay us money, we would give you some education, that kind of thing. I personally always had ambitions to be a digital company. I was like, how do we scale this? There are 7 billion people in the world. We've got to get decoded online. You know, we need to be an online e-learning MOOC. Uh, but gradually, as I've gone on, I've realized that actually the, the heart of what we do is that human interaction between the people who come on our workshops and the facilitators who run those workshops, we can scale that, I think. We can have it decoded in every uh, city, on every street, uh, with just like, engaging people who know what they're talking about, available for people to come in and, and talk to and, and learn from, but complemented with online technologies. So I think Code Academy on its own, it's no good. You need a teacher facilitating a classroom of people. If you're learning to code on your own, no matter the Code Academies or the Khan Academies, you need a developer that you can go to and say, how do I do this? The amount of time in my life, because I'm a self-taught uh, developer, I, I, no one, none of my friends were doing it. I didn't really have anyone apart from people online, which isn't quite the same. The amount of hours of my life, days, probably weeks or months, maybe even a year of my life, I've wasted struggling not knowing how to do something because there wasn't anyone to ask. Uh, so I think it's super important to have that human uh, business. And then how do we um, get our first clients? That was the network effect. So my business partner, Catherine Parsons, who I mentioned before, is very well connected. And uh, has just, yeah, and so is uh, my, my other business partner, Steve Henry, who used to run an advertising agency. The, uh, does exactly what it says on the tin, Ronson, Ron Soil thing. His company came up with that, amazing. The, uh, the, ta the um, tango happy slapping thing, that's Steve's idea. <laughs> it's not a good thing, is it? But uh, yeah, so he, they had a lot of people, and uh, we, it was about ringing up the phone, going and seeing people, and saying, come. It was a very um, old fashioned business model, essentially. You know, we've got this thing, we want you to buy it. Will you buy it? Sales process. Uh, and now one of the core and biggest teams at Decoded is our business development team, whose job it is to talk to people and be like, come. Of which Katie is one. Yeah, that's Katie out there. Um, does that help, does that answer? Cool, wicked, thanks. 
Any more questions? Go on. So you mentioned um, schools and teachers a number of times there. I just wondered how, out of curiosity, do they, do they get involved? So my girlfriend's an ICT coordinator at a primary school. Oh, perfect. Um, just taking on the role now, curious to, to learn and understand what she can start teaching the children, make it involving, exciting, et cetera, et cetera. So mm. how, how do they kind of get involved maybe with your organisation or just generally with organisations like yourself? So there's loads of stuff that she can do and that, and that schools can do generally. Um, first thing is definitely get in touch because we have got £100,000 of funding to, to send as many teachers as we can for that through Code Edna Day for free. Um, we're looking to run pilots. We're, we're partnering with Apps for Good. We're partnering with Microsoft. We're, we're partnering with CAS, Computing at School. Uh, and we're trying to get teachers in. Uh, we're also raising a further £900,000 uh, and we're setting up this foundation to provide uh, the funding there for, for teachers to, to do it. So it's, it's free, which is great. Um, but if, uh, for whatever reason, logistically or there is no time now, there's loads of stuff online. CAS is a really good resource, computing at school. Um, Scratch is really good, visual programming. This, uh, if you take one thing away for her, it's that idea there. Because HTML and CSS, they're not programming languages. You're not learning to program. But what you are learning is you're structuring content. Uh, HTML is not a million miles away from XML. It is, in fact, a subset of XML. And, uh, and so you're learning about structuring data, which is in the computer science curriculum. You're also learning to write code for a computer um, without having to worry about the kind of the computational thinking, the abstraction, abstractional thinking, all, all the sort of the difficult stuff. Because programming is hard. You, you know, you'll, you'll get some, I mean, oh yeah, it's not a very trendy thing to say, but like, you do have to work, I think for anything in life, you've got to work hard. And I think to master programming, you do have to put in some slog. But if you separate the two things out, so you learn building an interface in HTML and CSS, and CSS, and then you learn programming visually using tools like Scratch. Scratch is from MIT, who was speaking yesterday, and it's, a, it's massively popular. Google have released a, a free open source tool called Blockly, Blockly which um, allows you to drag blocks around, and you can create loops and if statements. and you can kind of learn the principles of programming without having to worry about the brackets and braces of syntax getting in the way. So she should get online and, and, and learn, get her kids doing some HTML and CSS, and then um, uh, Computing Unplugged is a great website with loads of resources on it. Uh, if you um, tweet at me, I'll send you some links. Cool. Any other, any other questions? What do, what do people want out of, I mean, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel as I've, I've under-delivered. So I don't know if it's talking about the design of a startup. I, who is expecting grids and typography and all that kind of stuff? So we can talk about that. No, let's not. Uh, any more questions? Go on. So, so as a startup company, yeah, you've been going a year, you said? Two years two now. Two years, yeah. What other problems did you have to overcome? Uh, I guess the, the initial one was the was not having any money and thinking we're going to do this alone, we're going to do this organically. So that was quite quite difficult. Um, Recruiting's been hard because what we need from our facilitators is um, com competent developers and uh, but also really good communicators, and that's quite a, a niche skill set. Most uh, people are one or the other, so we found that quite hard. Um, what else has been uh, difficult? It's actually it just, it's grown very naturally, and we've, we've not tried to grow faster than uh, cash flow. So it's all been quite natural. We, like, when we were doing more than uh, five workshops a month, we were spending more than the rent now costs on our massive 2,500 square foot sort of workshop space. It was like, okay, let's start renting this penthouse and start doing it. That felt very natural. Uh, I think um, winning over the hearts and minds of developers uh, was a was an interesting challenge early on because they were all just like get out of here, dicks, all that stuff. Uh, um, otherwise, uh, what else? I'm sure there's been loads of stuff. I think just sales, like the conversion process. It's a lot of money. We charge seven thousand pounds for a workshop, which uh, seven hundred pounds a head. We have got, got a new thing called Code in a Day Plus Plus, and I guess that was the big challenge we, we got was people like this is great for our executive board. This is great for ten people who are very senior, and we, we, we want to spend that kind of money on. But we've got 30,000 employees. We're not going to spend how many millions that would be on this course. Um, so we came up with Code in a Day Plus Plus, which is 20 people, 10 laptops, pair programming. Uh, you're working together. You're uh, collaborating. You're doing teamwork and stuff. So, that, so, yeah, there have been a number of challenges like that. Logistically, how do we scale it that we've kind of overcome like that as well? Um, cool. Any other questions? Or should we finish early? 
Thank you so much for sitting through that, by the way, guys. That was really, uh, it was really kind. You're feeling a very warm audience. Thank you. Cool.